Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, I have somebody very special. We have a lot of connection, even though we don't know each other and have never met, just spoke briefly before we started this recording. And her name is Elizabeth Tance, and she is a ghostwriter. And for the people out there, she does not write about ghosts. <laughs> what she does is she helps and assists authors in their writing skills and ability and in delving into their material, bringing it together to be a cohesive book. And it's a very special talent. I know having written a book that if I didn't have editors <laughs> to have guided me, it would have been a whole nother story. She's from St. Louis, and she has a passion for animals just like I do. So that was another part of the connection. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Elizabeth Pants. Hi. Thank How you. How are you today? I am great. I am really honored to have you. I feel connected to you somehow after reading and doing some research on you. Go ahead and start telling us your story. Go back as far as you can, where you grew up how you grew up, you know, what kind of family you had, what your ideas were, what you wanted to be, all those good things that make life so interesting. Okay, well, I was born and raised in St. Louis, so I haven't gotten far geographically. St. Louis is not a bad place to live. It's uh, definitely got a low low uh, cost of living. Uh, and for those of you who are living on the coast, it, it is flyover country, but we're known for the Gateway Arch. <laughs> <laughs> I lived on a hay farm when I was growing up, which was just outside of St. Louis city limits. And I have an older brother and an older sister, eight years and six years older, respectively. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. She also was diagnosed with MS right after I was born. So she was dealing with that back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And my dad worked at a factory. He was a World War II vet. And when he came back from the war, he got a job at a local factory. And that's where he stayed until about 1980 when they closed the factory for good. So that was uh, hard times then. Yeah. I grew up in a rural town myself and grew up on a potato farm, hay farm, cow farm, dairy farm, <laughs> whatever you want to call them. But it's kind of an all encompassing farm. We did a lot of different things. But living in small towns is a... Um, whole different experience than living in a big town. Mm -hmm. The town I grew up in, Oakville, really was its own little entity. There was still a general store with a hitching post out front. <laughs> One of our neighbors down the street rode her horse up into town. And town was not that far away. It looks nothing like what it did back then now. The hay farm was sold. It wasn't our farm. It was our neighbor's farm. My mom and dad rented a farmhouse for over 50 years wow. from the farmer. And when he passed away, he willed it to my parents, which was such a, a nice gift. So a couple of years before my mom passed, she was a homeowner, which was what she had always wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So kind of a happy ending there. What was your childhood like growing up it, on a farm? I know that it can be, there's challenges to it. And going to a small school is really can have a lot of challenges, but there's a lot of gifts in it too. Can you kind of talk about what your ideas around that are? Sure. I should preface it by saying that while I lived on a farm, there was a subdivision down the street. Suburbia was creeping in. So we did have neighbors that were very close to us. And so my school wasn't as much a farm school as it was just a small elementary school. But growing up in that area, you had to either have a car or a bicycle to get around. So I rode my bike everywhere. Now, I was born with some health challenges that I still have asthma today. And back then, before rescue inhalers and ways of treating it, there were things I just couldn't do. So a lot of times I spent my early childhood just hanging out in my room, reading and just devouring books. And, you know, I love to be outside. So I would also go outside and help my mom in the flower beds and my dad in the vegetable garden. So I still do those two things today. And, you know, the, I want to say the coolest thing about living where I grew up was at night, when there was no moon, I could go outside and lay in the grass and bring my little little dog, Ginger, our little black poodle with us, with me. And we would lay in the grass and look up at the sky and you could see the Milky Way. I know that well. That's it. That's awesome. I mean, uh, and it, I miss that. 
you know, we don't have that here anymore. St. Louis started building up and the, the ambient light is just so intense. And now I live into a, in, in a close in suburb. So it's rare to see even big stars. <laughs> I grew up, we, I used to, you know, my story somewhat. I used to go up on top of the hill and lay on my back and have a conversation mm-hmm. with God. And one of the other things that I would do in the evenings and the night is go up and lay because we were very north. So we were in upstate New York, almost on the Canadian borderline. And I would lay up there and watch the northern lights and aurora borealis is mm-hmm. what we called it. And, and it would just, if you've never experienced that, put it on your bucket list because it is so awesome. And for me, it was just a affirmation of God's power. <laughs> I just laid there and thought, how can people question God when you look at the aurora borealis and see these lights just shooting through the air? How can you challenge it? But, you know, I was young and nine years old. So what were your expectations? What were your expectations as a child? What, what would you, you think your life was going to be like? Wow, that's a really good question. Honestly, I had big dreams. I think every kid has big dreams, aside from wanting a horse. And by the way, I was allergic to hay. So like the Green Acres character that would say, I'm allergic smelling hay. That was me. <laughs> Couldn't go in the barn because I would immediately start having trouble breathing. But as a kid, my big dream was to go to New York. And I romanticized living in New York City. I used to draw as a kid. So I would draw out my studio apartment because I was smart. I knew I wouldn't be able to afford a big apartment. <laughs> wanted to go to either NYU or Fordham University. I wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to be a writer. So I wrote sappy, you know, little girl love stories. And then I would come out and write something kind of horrifically tragic, which would always scare my teachers. (laughs) Because why are you writing this? And I had a lot of support from my mom and especially from her mom, who instilled in both my sister and me that we could be anything we wanted to be. Wow, that's awesome right there. Because Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. And I often wonder what I could have been had I had that. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. The dreams that I had, you know, I think were in part just based on I didn't want to live where I was living. You know, I never felt like St. Louis was supposed to be home. I was always the kid that felt a little out of place in her own family. And I think now the reason that was the case was and I'm not sure if you anticipated this would go to this route, but my brother molested me when I was very young and it lasted for years. And I didn't remember any of it until I was a teenager and started messing around with my first boyfriend. And all of a sudden I went to bed one night as me and I woke up the next day with memories of things that I couldn't account for. And I became a different person. So those dreams and hopes and desires that I had kind of just were flushed away because I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't understand what had happened and why this brother that I had idolized could do these things to me. And I questioned myself, is this really real or am I just making this up? The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. Did you think that maybe, and I'm trying to put my head into your head. That's a scary thing. You know, do you think you knew as a child you were being molested and repressed it till you were a teenager when you started to become a woman and active and sexually active and all that? Yes. Yes. That's what happened. Yeah. Because in our household, that was one of the things you just didn't talk about. You know, you didn't talk about sex. My mom was a product of parents that 
had their own issues. And she was raised a lot by the farmers that were part of our family that lived in the middle of Missouri. So she spent all of her summers there. And that really did have an impact on how she framed her life, how she framed her role in life, and how open and communicative she would be. She was a great mom. I don't want anybody to think she wasn't. But there were just certain things you couldn't talk about. And yeah. sex was one of them. So yeah. I loved my mother dearly and my father both. But their parenting skills lacked in so many areas. They never encouraged their children. And my dad was a functioning alcoholic. And my mom had to deal with that. And it was just a whole bunch of things. But what I found interesting about us is that when you were young, you were an avid reader. What did you read? What kind of books? Oh, gosh, anything. I loved biographies. We didn't have a library that close, so the bookmobile would come. And I still remember what the bookmobile smelled like. (laughs) And I have these vivid memories of going in and pulling out, I remember, an Abe Lincoln book, Frederick Douglass, Betsy Ross, just all those books that you would want to read as a kid of all those people you that at least I looked up with. And I'd come out with, you know, a stack of books that would be yay high. I'd read them all in a week and then go back and do it again. Yeah. I actually read all the classics, you know, I mean, the Iliad and the Odyssey. I went to, yes. when I was young, I was in parochial school, Catholic school, mm-hmm. and I was taught by uh, nuns and priests, which was brutal, actually. <laughs> I mean, they were brutal. I mean, mm. I got my hands whooped so many times Ooh. by the priests with a cat and nine tail that I would go home with my hand so ah. blistered that I couldn't couldn't move my fingers. And my uh, my mom and dad, I said, asked me what happened to my hands. And I said, I was looking out the window when I was supposed to be studying. And the priest came up with cat nine tail and just walloped me. Today, he'd go to jail for child abuse. Oh my gosh. But, But anyway, I read Shakespeare. I mean, and I meant starting like in third grade, I started Mm -hmm. reading the classics. Plus my parents, When we moved from the city to the country and I had no neighbors, that was the other part. You had suburbia around you. I had, my nearest neighbor was like two, three miles away and they were elderly. But my parents did have a large library in this old rundown house that we moved to. Mm -hmm. And I used to read in there and I ran across the book one time and it was called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Oh, wow. Wow. And it set my world on fire Mm -hmm. because it started me dreaming because up to that point, I was very depressed. And because we had moved from suburbia, I had lost what was so dear to me was baseball. We had no baseball teams or little league or anything I could play out. All I had was the farm. So for me, that was really, you know, kind of my escape into a world of fantasy Mm -hmm. was reading Walter Mitty. And it just became something ingrained in me. And I learned to dream through it. So did you have anything you read that struck you and has stuck with you all this time? My mom was an avid reader as well. And she loved Agatha Christie. So I read all of the Agatha Christie books. And I still love Agatha Christie. You know, in terms of other books, I still have some of the childhood books that I read One of them is called Ribsy, and it was about a dog, a bedraggled dog that he was called Ribsy because he was so thin and kind of the story of him getting lost and his family searching for him. And that I kind of really related to that because I really felt, even as a kid, before I knew anything about what my brother was doing, I just felt kind of lost. Like I just didn't fit in. And I'm sure part of that was because there were things I just couldn't do as a kid. I spent a lot of gym classes sitting on the stage, Mm -hmm. watching all of my friends do stuff that I couldn't do because I couldn't breathe. But, you know, my dream, I think, really was to be free. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be free. I didn't want people telling me what to do. I was a good kid, but I would chafe at authority. And but I would do it in a way that nobody would know. (laughs) (laughs) And that was really what drove me to start my own business after being in the corporate world and being in sales and having a a pretty free life doing what I was doing, but still having a boss. I just didn't want that anymore. A lot of that has to do with your ability to process your expectations. Believe it or not, it does. Because when we look at our expectations through a lens of faith, and that faith isn't always necessarily about 
a religious faith. I'm talking about faith in the future, yourself. There's this core expectation we have that comes from dreaming and reading and all of those things. We start to develop these expectations for ourselves. And that's what I call core expectations. So when you have that faith, it changes your perspective of everything. And you can challenge and do it politely, nicely, and attain that freedom that you're talking about. If you live in through the lens of fearful expectations, everything stops. It stops you along the way at every point. And I think in talking to you that you unwittingly, unknowingly developed an expectation for going to New York and adventure and living the life that you were meant to live Mm -hmm. versus people who live to the expectations of others. Because when you live to the expectations of the others, it creates a great deal of unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And you have to live to your own expectations to find true happiness. So, And honestly, I grew up, got married right out of college. I did exactly what you were just talking about. I was living the expectations of other people. I had a psychology degree. There's not much you can do with a psych degree except go on and get your master's degree and maybe a doctorate. (laughs) So when I got my bachelor's degree, I didn't know what to do. I was very good at playing the victim. And it's like, nobody's helping me. I don't know what to do. Oh, I guess I'll get married. Yeah, I don't understand how that logic worked in my brain. But I did get my son from that relationship. So that was definitely a blessing because he's my only child. But my point is, I was living the expectation life. So I should be doing this. I should be doing that. I should have a career. I had to be married. I had to have a man. You know, I don't exactly know where that came from, but I know that it was probably a message that I received as a kid. It's probably societal Mm -hmm. because, you know, I got married at 18 and had a son. When I came home from Vietnam out of the Marine Corps, got married right away. And I thought it was about love. But really, when I look back on it, it was for me feeling like I was supposed to just, that was making my life complete. And I'm blessed that I have a wonderful son who's a therapist (laughs) (laughs) and he does wonderful things and he's great. And I have two other children from my late wife. Yeah, we get these societal expectations that really can guide our life into something that really is not meant to be. I see today's millennials. I applaud them because they don't seem to be driven. And maybe Gen Xers were the same way. They don't seem to be driven by those societal expectations. My fiance, Mike, has two kids and they're both in college and neither one really dates. They're very focused on their studies. They're very focused on what they're going to do once they get out of college. His son kind of has his life mapped out. And I admire that because I wasn't raised that way. I didn't do that. And maybe if I had, well, I could be dead now. So that's usually what I say is if I could go take that other road, I might be dead. So I'm alive in this life. (laughs) Yeah, I have feelings about this both ways because I work with millennials and some are really good at mapping out life. But what happens what to them when life doesn't work out the way that they were supposed to, how they handle it can become a challenge for them. Because they had it so mapped out. And when an obstacle comes before them that is insurmountable and it has to change the course of their life, say going to college, expecting that you're going to get a job out of college after getting a degree in even computer engineering and and all these sought after things, sometimes they lose sight and give up. Mm. And that's where they need the help. But When you're working with your expectations, you have to learn how to expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. I talk about it a lot. How do you learn to master the unexpected? Well, the way is you have to prepare for it just like everything else. You have to become mindful that life isn't always going to work out. Life isn't always going to be on a path of your choosing through death, through... I mean, I was on a life of just soaring great. I was going to retire and have lots of money to retire with until my wife was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2003. I never expected it. I thought she was going to live with me forever. Right. And it doesn't happen that way. And I know you've been through it with your mom and dad. We don't always know what's going to happen. So we have to have it a mindset of awareness that when something happens that we're 
not expecting. How do we get through that? Well, we have to look at it through the lens that it's meant to teach us something. It's meant to change our course and teach us something that we have to look at it through the lens of faith and saying, I'll be able to get through this and figure it out and get through it. And and know it sounds so simplistic, but how else do you expect the unexpected? There's no other way to do it except being mindful of it and knowing that no matter whatever happens to you, it is meant to teach you a lesson. I look at it as everything as a learning lesson in life, and it has gotten me to where I am today. And for that, I am thankful. Of course, I've had challenges. Of course, you've had challenges. Everybody has challenges. What makes all the difference is how we get through them, and we don't let it defeat us. So right. there's my preaching. <laughs> But you're absolutely right. I think faith in, whether it's faith in your abilities, faith in a God, Mm -hmm. faith in the goodness of other people, I think that's part of what drives me forward. And I mean, I've been married three times. The last one was a very long relationship. I, you know, I was clearly looking for something. And my last marriage was good, but we were really friends. And I stayed in the relationship way longer than I should have. And when I finally decided it was time for me to leave, because I I was waiting really for my son to get to a certain age, because he really looked at my last husband as dad, Mm -hmm. he'd been around since he was four. I read the book, Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. (laughs) And I thought after I finished it, it was like, there's a lot of life out there that I am not living. And I know if I stay here, neither I nor my then husband will live the life we could be living, but separately. And that was really what started me down the path of it's now it's time. It really is time. And I do believe for me, we're always signs of like, if I was in a job and it's like, okay, it's time to leave now. It's like, well, how do you know that? It's like, because I'm finished. I am complete with this role in my life. I need to move to the next thing. And that was something my mom never understood about me. She called me a quitter. But really what it was, is I wanted the experience of doing different things. It didn't mean that I wanted to become a downhill skier. That was actually never anything that I did as a kid, but I didn't want to be whatever that was. I wanted to see if it was a fit. Is this a fit? Oh, that's not a fit. I'm going to go do this. Oh, that's not a fit either. But in her mind, because she was somebody who would do something and stick with it, even if she hated it, I was a quitter. And it took a long time before I really understood that about myself, that I love change and variety. I love experience and I love freedom. That is my core value is freedom. So now I have it. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. And that's a beautiful thing because I call what you a doer. You just do things. And if they fit, you stick with it. If it doesn't, then you put it aside and do something else. And when I talk to high school and middle school kids, I tell them, Go out and become a doer. Just try things. Just do it. And you'll find your passion. You'll find the thing that makes you complete, that fulfills you, makes you happy. And that's Mm -hmm. so important. And that's what I think millennials do today better than any other group in our culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a friend who traveled, I don't know how many countries. I mean, it's literally like 15, 20 countries she's been to. Nice. And she's done it all by herself. She just goes and does it. And she's figured out a way to earn enough money that she can get from place to place to place. And she has no fear about traveling and all that. But it has made her so worldly and so knowledgeable about 
different cultures and life and everything, Mm -hmm. that there's a real beauty in it. And now she's moved to Austin and she's starting to settle down and into her groove. Honestly, I don't know her age. I would assume she's somewhere between 30 and 35. But I'm Are you not... talking about Phoebe? Yes, I am. <laughs> I didn't know you knew Phoebe. I have listened to her podcast and we've sparred back and forth on Twitter. Oh, really? She... <laughs> Phoebe is special. I mean, I love Phoebe to death. And I just love her ability to just do things. She tries things and she's not afraid. And I don't call people fearless anymore. I stopped that a few months back. Because everybody has a fear. There's some fear that everybody has. Mine is if you put a tightrope across the Grand Canyon or Niagara Falls and ask me to walk it, I'd have fear. So I stopped calling people fearless because we're fearless about some things and we have fear about other things. It depends on what your fear is about. So, but yes, it's about Phoebe and Nazareth and I just love her to death. So yeah, I really admire everything that she's done. Mm-hmm. And part of me is like, yeah, I could have been like that. It's like, okay, well, I can be like that now. Mm-hmm. And you and, can, and you can, and everybody can. Mm-hmm. They just have to make the choice to do it and not be fearful. I think your point also about not sticking with something too long when you realize that hey, this isn't really working for me. I did that when I first went out on my own, when I started the Hired Pen, which was my first mm-hmm. business. And I wrote, if somebody had money, I would work for them. And But it really didn't suit me because I was bringing in clients that I really didn't want to work with. Some of them I did. So if any of them see this, I'm not going to tell you which ones I didn't want to work with. Some of you I loved and some of you I didn't. Believe me, they they will know the difference. Yeah. (laughs) Believe me, people are intuitive and they will know the difference. (laughs) It's what it is, you know, and I think you need to be honest about that. Because, I mean, we all work with people that we don't want to work with and having the choice to and not to is freedom. And that was really where I came to in in 2016 when I was burned out. It's like, okay, I'm not enjoying what I'm doing. I'm not marketing myself particularly well. I'm going to go find a job. And it was during that whole job hunt that my dog died, Katie. And I stopped doing everything and just had to sit in, what is it that I really want to do? Because I didn't want to go get a job. And I'm pretty sure I'm not employable because I haven't worked in a company since 2002. And it just holds no appeal. The only thing appealing about it is getting a regular paycheck. So if I can figure out how to get a regular paycheck, stay at home and do what I want to do, then maybe that's the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes going on here. (laughs) But once I really sat down and grieved Katie's loss because she'd been with me for 13 and a half years, I got very clear on where I needed to go. And it wasn't like this "Ah," from on high, Mm -hmm. but it was kind of like this download of, well, this is what you love to do. Why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you focusing exclusively in books and publishing and working with people to bring their stories to life? It's like, oh yeah, that is really what I like to do. And that's where Fuzzy Dog came from. Yeah, I was thinking that when you were talking about, I had a dog named Chloe who was given to me when my wife, it's a long story and I'm not going to go into how I got her, but but Chloe was given to us when Vicky got cancer in 2003. And Chloe and I just became close. I mean, she was a giant schnauzer that was 155 pounds. <gasps> oh, that is a giant schnauzer. <laughs> and she was massively strong, not fat, just massively strong. Wow. And anyway, when in 2008 or nine, she passed away. Oh. And, and it was three years after. Well, no, it had to be longer than that. Vicky passed away in 2006. 2003, we got her. In 2013 is when Chloe died because I had her 10 years Mm -hmm. and it devastated me. I wrote a blog called uh, My 10-Year Love Affair. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Go read it on my blog. I will. It's a (laughs) tearjerker. I get that. But anyway, one of the things that we have in common in speaking about loving and caring is that we've both lost someone very dear. You lost both your mom and dad, but I know you took care of your dad for a period of time until he died. And I I took care of my wife for three years while she was dying of ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. And being a caregiver is a really challenging task, especially to somebody that you love and care about. Mm -hmm. And what did you learn out of the experience of caring for your father? Well, I learned I was the favorite. (laughs) 
You know, for me, that was a very challenging time because my mom had died unexpectedly. My father wasn't in the best of health. My sister was dealing with her husband who had a brain tumor. He had a glioblastoma. So he was going to die. And my marriage was not particularly good. And I was struggling to make money. And I had been the breadwinner in my household. And when I left the corporate world, my then husband was not very happy about that. He worked, but it was those grand trips and the stuff that we used to do, the nice cars. We couldn't do that anymore because I wasn't making a ton of money. So when I started taking care of my dad, it was kind of a blessing and a curse because I loved that I could give back to him for raising me, for being my dad, because I loved my dad. I loved my mom, but my dad was it. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard for me to watch him decline because he had type 2 diabetes that went undiagnosed for several years because of a bad physician. It had affected his brain. So some of the dad that I knew wasn't there anymore. And that made it more challenging. But then we would have these very sweet moments where you know he knew what was going on in my life and he would counsel me. And he was able to be my dad in a way that he wasn't when I was younger because he was always working. You know, my dad, I used to say, my dad's a bedroom door. He's always sleeping because he always worked swing shift at the factory mm -hmm. to make more money. And so I cherish those memories of my dad. And there are some funny ones. I wrote a story about the day he called because he wanted me to get him a prescription for Viagra because he had a girlfriend. And you might imagine how I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> My sister thought it was hilarious. My dad's doctor thought it was hilarious. And it's like, this is really not funny. <laughs> I'm really, now I don't, you know, because again, we didn't talk about sex growing up. <laughs> it's like, here's my dad wanting to. <laughs> and uh, by the way, my dad, the doctor said no, because my dad had a heart problem. And he's like, but I'd go happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I wanted to say something. You had mentioned that I'm a ghostwriter and you say, I don't write about ghosts. But one of my clients right now is a medium. And oh, so you are writing about ghosts. Yeah, I, I, am, I am working with her to get her book finished and she talks to ghosts. And uh, recently I had a strange experience where I was in my office and was doing some research and found something and said aloud, oh, wow. And immediately after I said that, I heard, wow, huh? And I looked around, Mike wasn't home yet. And like, okay, I didn't make that up. I felt like I truly heard it with my ears and there's nobody here. So I talked with my client. She's like, oh, that's your dad. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I wish he would have not scared the crap out of me. <laughs> but, you know, I'm glad he's around yeah. and maybe he can help me with the gardening this year. Through taking care of him, what would you say your greatest learning experience was with that? That patience really is a virtue because there were times when I was not patient with him. And, and that makes me sad because I was busy because, you know, because I'm human mm -hmm. where I could have done more for him. My sister's the middle child and she has a different personality than I do. And I was more, I'm more, or was more of like the type A, got to get stuff done. Whereas she was, she has always been more caring and in a way of caregiving. And so that's the role that she played with my dad once, once her husband passed. And I was more the doer. I was the one that got stuff done, got the, you know, the appointments made, got his prescriptions from the VA. I was able to do all of those things. And and then one day I realized that I was doing all of these things, but I really wasn't feeling them. I wasn't being there for him. And when I made that shift, sadly, very late in his life, it started really with a conversation about taking out the feeding tube that he had because he would aspirate his food and he would develop pneumonia. Mm -hmm. His doctor had a feeding tube put in. Mm -hmm. And dad said, that's the last thing that I had to enjoy was eating. Your mother's gone. I can't drink. I can't smoke. Eating and being with other people at the mealtime is all I have. And now I don't even have that. And he was depressed. Mm -hmm. And the conversation wound around to, well, dad, if you want the feeding tube take out, taken out, we can do that. But you have to understand that that will kill you. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're, you know, if we take it out in January, chances are you're going to be gone by June. And he's like, okay. 
I'm okay with that. And what I saw from him doing that was reclaiming ownership of his life Mm -hmm. and standing up for what he wanted and what he knew his soul needed before he passed. So he, we took the feeding tube out. He got pneumonia. They sent him to the hospital in March. They got him better. He came back and the nursing home where he was at at that point said, look, you have to sign a paper. If this happens again, he's not going back to the hospital because it's mm-hmm. just going to be this recurring cycle. Right. So I sat down with dad and, you know, we cried a little bit, you know, to see my dad get very teary was unusual. Mm-hmm. He was not a crier, but he understood. And in June of 2006, he got pneumonia and was struggling to breathe. And my sister happened to be there. And she said that he's afraid. And I said, I know. I said, and this is this is what he wanted. And so I was there the next morning, but they'd already induced him in a, a medically induced coma mm-hmm. so that he would not suffer as his body began to shut down. Yeah. So I spent that last 24 hours at his side, you know, spent the night at the nursing home, just kind of waiting and just talked to him, mm-hmm. you know, and, and yeah, I think he heard me. And then when he finally passed, he opened his eyes, which was shocking. It was like, oh my gosh, his eyes are open. And he was talking to someone. And while and I, I just relayed this story to a friend, I said, while he was not smiling, there was joy mm-hmm. in his face. There was a bit of surprise, but there was joy. And then he was gone. So what did I learn by taking care of my dad? One, every day is precious. Two, take control of your life. Retain control of your life. Just because you're older doesn't mean you shouldn't have a say in what happens to you. And I think dad felt that very clearly that, that he wanted some aspect of control because he'd been on his own since he was a teen. So it's dignity. Yes. Yes. He wanted his dignity. When Vicki was dying, she got a C. diff infection, you know, uh, what just takes over your body because of the chemo. The chemo had weakened her immune system to and her brain. Her last few months of life were they had given her thalidomide, remember, the, that caused all the birth defects in England? Yes. Well, they use it for cancer now as part of a cancer treatment. And they had given her that. And as soon as they gave it within 24 hours, I saw a drastic difference. And it was just a few months after that. My daughter was getting married during the process of her dying. Oh. And I'm not sure Vicky really, she knew it was happening, but she couldn't react to it. You know, so it was difficult. But her last, I took her to the hospital because she had gotten so sick. And the doctor came out and told me that the end is near. And I said, okay. And uh, the doctor talked me into, I had taken care of her at home all the time. And the doctor had talked me into putting in her hospice for the last few days. Mm -hmm. And she did not want to go into hospice. I mean, she really, and her sister, she had a twin sister, and a younger sister. And I know they got mad at me because I let the doctor talk me into it. Mm -hmm. We went to hospice. We were there one hour. And I said, called the doctor and said, we can't do this because we had what I called the Gestapo nurse because it's C. diff infection. It's very infectious. And they quarantined her. And her friends, high school friends from her, actually her elementary school friend from California had come to Austin to spend the last days with her. And her sisters were there and our children were there. And uh, the nurse was so insensitive to surroundings. I called Dr. Smith and said, Ellen, this is what's happening. She said, Art, pick Vicki up by her bed and sign her out of there and take her home and let her die with dignity. Mm. And I did it. Mm -hmm. And I took her home. And of course, hospice was going to now didn't want to be out of the picture. They wanted to come to the house, which we lived very rural in a, on a ranch. And the nurse would come out and she'd say to me tonight, you know, she can't make it through the day. That went on for a week. Oh, and wow. When Friday night on September 16, 2006 came, I went into the bedroom and I laid down with her and her breathing was just, and then it would, you know, the sound, it's just, the, it's just like it's forever. Uh, anyway, like between those breaths, yes. Yeah. Anyway, Chloe, our dog, came in, jumped up on the bed, which she never ever did. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's 155 pounds, 
laid down next to Vicky, put her paw across her. Mm. And I whispered in Vicky's ear and told her it's okay to go. And that night she went just like that. Just, Mm -hmm. and the thing that I think I learned about all this was that communication is so critical to our human existence Mm -hmm. and to authentically and gratefully communicate with the people you love and care about is the greatest gift that we're given. And we should just do it. (laughs) That's going back to just do it, you know, right. And really, really uh, just live, live. Don't let things get in your way. Don't let the obstacles put you in a place. Just go do it and live life. And everything always works out the way that it's intended to work. Sorry, I didn't mean to get this sentimental. (laughs) Please don't apologize because, you know, we don't see enough of that today, in my opinion. You know, the thing with my mom and dad, I know they're both free from the things that hurt them here on earth. And that gives me peace. The thing that that I love is that Mike's parents are still here and his dad is short like my dad was. And his dad's, I love his dad to pieces and his mom is great. And we get along really well. I've never had a mother-in-law that really liked me. It's like, yay, she likes me. And, you know, we have a lot of fun together. And so it's nice to be able to be here for them and to be a bit of a counterweight for Mike, who, you know, is kind of more the way I was with my parents. You know, it's like, they're your parents. You have a relationship and I'm coming in and saying, you know, there are other ways that we can do things with your mom and dad. I would like to see them more because they're not going to be here forever. And I said, the day that they're gone is the day when you realize you're the next line, you've stepped up to the front of the line, and your family is now all behind you. I said, so let's do stuff with them now that brings them joy and brings us joy too. I said, because your parents are fun to be with. And he's like, okay, I guess, you know. (laughs) You know, but what it really boils down to, I think, is that you've had this experience and the experience is the best teacher. And now you've learned and now you want to pass it on to Mike and his family And you want them to know and have what you have. You've learned so much. And that's just amazing. I'm remarried now and married to the most wonderful woman. My kids love her to death. I love her to death. We have so much fun together. But I learned so much stuff from my first two marriages, you know, because I was married for a short time first and then 35 years to Vicki before she Mm -hmm. passed away and now Beverly. And Beverly has been the biggest blessing in my life because She accepts me for who I am. She's 10 years younger than I am. I'm going to be 72 and she's, well, I just give her age away. (laughs) She's going to be 62 this year. (laughs) I'm going to be in trouble. But anyway, (laughs) I've always not appreciated the term a person completes another person because I don't believe that somebody completes you. Mm -hmm. They compliment you. Mm -hmm. And she compliments me to, and is such an encourager. I wouldn't be where I am today without her encouragement and support. And I just got to tell her, I love you. And I'm so thankful that she is in my life because she has brought out the absolute best things in me. And that is such a blessing. And we have so much fun. We can say things to each other. And, you know, I'll tell you the story. Beverly, I met her on Mm Match.com. And I saw her eyes and I said, There's something in her eyes that just strikes me. Mm -hmm. Beverly was, uh, when we met, she was 52, 53 years old. I was 62 or 63. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She she had never been married. Really? Yes. Never been married. A nurse anesthetist makes great money, was able to take care of herself. And she told me, she said, I asked her one time, I said, she had boyfriends that were doctors and lawyers and, you know, could offer her so much more than me Mm -hmm. financially. But she said, you know, and it was, it just struck me. She said, I've never met a man who I thought could love me like you do. Oh, you know, which is worth a lot more than money. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's a lot, 
but we've had such a great time. We've traveled and we've done stuff and and she encourages me always in my endeavors and I encourage her. Mm-hmm. And that's such an important part of marriage. It's it's more than good sex and good financial statements and, and all that. There's that connection when you really complement each other. And I always tell when I'm counseling people on marriage and before they get married, you cannot marry somebody and think you can change them. Right. You can never change them because that's what a lot of people do is they see things that they don't agree with and say, oh, I can change that. Mm-hmm. My advice to them is you'll never change them. They are who they are. Let them be who they are and go find who you want. Do not settle. Do not settle for anything less than what you want out of life and what they want out of life. Make sure those two can gel just like strawberry jam. So sweet and so good that you could never stop eating it. So, right. you know, it's just, it's just my ideas on marriage. So, Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. And I would say that, you know, meeting Mike, we actually didn't like each other when we first met. And we were part of a singles group that I joined. My sister was already part of it. And I had just gotten out of a really horrific relationship. You talk about attracting someone in to teach you a lesson. The lesson I learned was I deserve much better than this. And if I continue not facing the emotional things that I need to face with a therapist, I'm going to end up with somebody much worse. The guy was just an emotionally abusive and getting to the point where it could have verged into physical abuse as well. So got out of that, started doing, got, getting the help that I needed and joined the singles group and, and then met Mike and we could talk. I'm a really good listener. No surprise. I'm an introverted ghostwriter. So I would sit and listen to him. He's an attorney and a musician and he can talk until he can just talk and talk and talk and talk. And I'll just sit and nod. He really thought I could not talk. So we tried to go out on a date. Didn't work. It was like, ugh, you know, but we were still seeing each other. And I think if we had not still saw each other at events, we never would have gotten together ever. And, but because we did, we became friends and we had a lot of fun hanging out and we would crack each other up with jokes and we liked the same things. And, you know, we both liked to walk and hike and be outside and, Those were the things that began, and we both liked music, and so we would go to concerts together, and those things began to bind us together, so that when we finally started to date, we had a foundation already of friendship and knowledge, and it wasn't based on good sex or hot Mm -hmm. sex. It wasn't based on that. It was based on those other things that I think are equally important. And he was really the first guy that I'd ever gone that route with. In fact, I didn't really want to date him when he finally said to me, well, do you see this going anywhere? It's like, well, what do you mean? (laughs) (laughs) We're friends. I like having guy friends. And he looked disappointed. It's like, oh, you mean this could go somewhere else? I really just, sorry, I wasn't thinking that way. So it's funny. We laugh about it now. We've been together seven years and it's been good. Good. That's the way it's supposed to be. You never know what's in front of us. You never know what's going to happen. The only thing you can do is be open to the possibilities. Mm -hmm. I'm always open to the possibility of everything. I talk about it a lot, the possibility of everything. Mm -hmm. Because when you think anything and everything is possible, it gives you the power of choice to pick and choose what you want to pursue and what you don't want to pursue. And it's a beautiful thing. It's very free, very opening. It's just a great feeling to have. And I've always enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I think that is something you and I have in common because I've had people say, well, why do you want to get married again? You've been married three times and divorced three times. And I said, you know, 
I do believe in love. I'm a Libra. So it's, that's part of our makeup. But I said, I really believe that that foundation of marriage, for me, it's important. There is a security aspect of it. I said, but there's that familial aspect of it too. I really want to be some part of something bigger than just me. Yeah. And I think that it's the part of marriage is that it's a way to bind people together. Not that you wouldn't be bound together without it. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of our religious and social upbringing. I mean, because some people do great not being married, but I've never, I'm like you, I never looked at marriage as something that would uh, confine me, especially when I can be who I am. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a beauty in that. And I think that that's really important. So I agree. I agree. And it is that connection. And it is personal. It is a personal viewpoint. So someone who may be listening to this saying, oh, well, you know, marriage, everybody's free to do what they want. Mm -hmm. This for me was something that was important. And Mike's the guy I will stay with unless he decides I'm not the right person, but I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's the power of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot said in that in the power of choice. So, well, Elizabeth, you know what? We we have been talking over an hour. (laughs) That does not surprise me. And it doesn't seem like it. Mm -mm. Well, I hate to say this, but it's nearing our time to end. Can you tell my audience where they can get a hold of you, how they can get a hold of you, what's coming up in your life, you know, work-wise that you want to do? I understand you've got a podcast that's going to, you want to put out and all that. So can you tell us all about your personal business information? (laughs) I can certainly do that. If anyone's interested, they can check out my website at fuzzydogllc.com. And you can find me on pretty much any social media. I'm either under Fuzzy Dog LLC or my name, Lizbeth Tans. And my podcast is going to be called The Author Confidential. It is geared toward people that want to write books or that are in the book writing industry. It's kind of a play on a 1940s radio show. And I want to dispel the myths and the misconceptions about book writing, book editing, book publishing and marketing, because there are a lot of them out there. And I think that's going to be fun. And we'll, so I'll be talking to industry experts as well as authors like Art and uh, hearing what their story is and how, what their book writing process is, because everybody's different and everyone has a different process. And I find that fascinating. Yeah, that sounds really great. I'm going to really be anxious to not only listen to it, but become involved in it with you because I have a unique story about how my book came about and all that. So love it. It's it's great. So, and it's been a pleasure having you on. Actually, I'm going to invite you back because I think that we have a lot of great things to talk about and really a great connection. And I thank you. Well, thank you. This has been such a pleasure and it's so great to connect with like-minded people. And when I heard an interview you did on a different podcast, it was like, oh, I got to talk to this guy. He's so cool. (laughs) So I'm very glad we've connected and thanks for having me on. Well, it's been my pleasure. To the Shower of Epiphany's audience, I'm going to check out and let Heather White take us away. And thank you for listening and have a great day and become a doer. Go make doo-doo all over the earth. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, folks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.